coming in this morning past the um, Central Library and the Wainwright Building and then taking a right at the, um, the Gateway Arch. I, I get why we're here. So thanks to Mary and um, the National Park Service, and I guess especially the Center for um, Preservation Technology and also training. So thanks to, for, to you all for putting this together and having this, this conference. Um, it's important, I think, when we're thinking about preservation, and obviously everybody does a lot around this room, um, knowing where you came from and what part of the sort of cultural heritage that's establishing the intellectual logic of what we're talking about. So that's where, where I'm changing gears a bit uh, for this, this conversation. Um, when Joe King and I first started working on the Paul Rudolph research and published the book in 2002, Rudolph's practice, private practice, started in 1952. So the middle of that early first period of Rudolph's work had just turned 50. And I think a lot of people knew where that work was coming from, Gropius coming over. It was well understood, the sort of Harvard education system and the logic that set up that work that Paul Rudolph was good at, I would argue, the best of his generation. And that why, that's one of the reasons I think a lot of that work is important. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about his work setting up a new generation of architects that I became really interested in recently since I, I live in um, Tucson, Arizona. There's a great architect that was trained under Rudolph at Yale uh, named Judith Chafee. And she graduated in the class of 1960. So doing the math and thinking about when she graduated and when they were starting their practice, going back and thinking about 50 years, that work is coming up now for consideration, I think. So trying to figure out how to lay the groundwork for the intellectual sort of structure for this group of architects. When you look at this plan, this is Paul Rudolph's first project, which came out of his uh, graduate master's thesis. Um, it's all about thinness. This is this idea of attenuation. And Rudolph talked a lot about some of the most important things in his life. One of them was working at the Brooklyn Naval Yard and this notion of getting things down to their efficiency, getting everything down to its material essence. And you can see that coming through Gropius at Harvard. And also, he talked about travels in Europe. So he talked about those things as being the most important um, parts of his research. You know, his drawings are what took him out into the world. I think that's why when you're working off the radar in a place like the west coast of Florida in Sarasota, you needed something to get you out into the world. And one of the ways he did it was through his drawings. And this is that project for the Finney Guest House that really took him out into the world when a lot of people couldn't get to him. And one of the things that really changed everything, I think, um, when he started thinking about becoming a spokesperson more than just a, a practicing architect, there's a French publication called Architecture of Today, and they asked Rudolph to look at Gropius's career and begin to figure out how that pedagogical structure began to create these architects that came out of that, that, that cultural time, that time in our culture. And a couple things that stand out, and it's, it's, it's pretty clear what Gropius was trying to get at. He was very systematic about laying out what the um, pedagogical intent was for Harvard. There were a couple of faculty there that were really important. So there was Gropius, for Breuer, I think Rudolph was very important, and also people like Siegfried Gideon. So they, they had professional studies as one of their categories. Field practice, where you go out and you look at building. And this is the surprising one to a lot of people. The understanding of principles based on historical precedent. So I think a lot of people talk about this generation not having a real strong sense of history, but if you're looking at somebody like Siegfried Gideon talking about your work in the context of a lot of work that came before you, that's a really important thing. So really, I think for, for us in this room, understanding the cultural context that begins to establish that work, I think the cultural context for Harvard is pretty well known and it's been pretty well known for a while. I think this new generation that everybody will start looking at very soon, I hope, it's less known. And that's what the paper that is written that I hear may possibly will come out in September. Everybody can read all the papers from the conference. This talk will be slightly different, so hopefully it'll be an extension of that. These are some of the drawings that I'm showing right now that are a bit hard to read because they're from this Architecture of Today publication. These are some of the drawings, these systematic studies of everything from different structural systems to wind loads to even things like cost projections. What is the cost if you start adding floors to something? What's the structural cost? What's the cost for materials? Gropius was great about the science of design, really beginning to understand all these parts of it. And I think that's really fascinating to look at the evidence for that. But there's also these intangible things that he always talked about to his students, dealing with the psychological nature of space or even the importance of regionalism. So there's these things when we look back at archives, we can begin to understand by looking at drawings like this and understanding how Rudolph began to draw 
and began to explain his projects based on this experience, but then trying to figure out some of those intangible parts too, and that's an interesting part of the puzzle to begin to untangle. This is um, the project that Rudolph included in that Architecture of Today publication. This is his Revere Quality Guest House with, with his then partner, Ralph Twitchell. This is a project that was seen by a lot of people in the day. Over 40,000 people came through this house. And you can begin to see photographs, at great Ezra Stoller photographs, and he was able to capture, I think, the life of the place. You know, you can be, imagine sitting on that chair, you can imagine that lawn, this courtyard. But you can also look at Rudolph's drawings and see all those things that were important to him. Not well laid out, but you can look at the, the bottom and you can see some structural understanding of this very attenuated, uh, it's called a lamellific concrete system, a cast in place residential concrete system. So understanding the relationship between the solids and voids and the placing of reinforcing materials. Perspectives that begin to show the spatial layout how the column begins to connect to all the other structural systems, the, the Lally columns. So you can begin to see Rudolph taking those drawings that were really important to Gropius and beginning to make an architectural practice out of them. And I'm going to talk a, a, a bit about a, a series of drawings that he looked at that I always, I always called drawing construction, where he was beginning to look at the relationship, in this case, between the spatial logic of something and the structural logic of something. And I think this makes his work very indicative of this generation that came out of Harvard um, just before and after the war. This is the Levin Good House and the structural framing system for that, St. Petersburg, Florida. This is the Burnett residence overlaying the, the spatial layout with the, the, again, the lamellithic construction system, thin lally columns coming up. And I just throw a, an Ezra Stoller photograph in here where you can really see this pushing of material limits, that sort of culture and ethic of the naval yard coming in. This idea of just taking basic sort of structural ideas like the vault and bringing that to marine grade plywood and you get this absolute thinness in this plane above. You get a spanning of about seven foot six, seven foot eight depending and you get a very thin material profile. So trying to figure out ways because he was competing with people that were in the merchant builder business. So he had to compete in some way with other people that were building houses on the west coast of Florida. And the one way he did it, and he thought his training allowed for him to be um, special, and I think competitive, was he could begin to sort of think about material logic in a very strategic kind of way and think about material thinness. Of course, it also, they also, he also knew how to build in the south. You can see that it rises out of the ground. It rises out in block. So you touch the ground in a particular kind of way. You protect it. And then the lighter construction sits above. And here again is that lamellithic system and trying to figure out, you see the young architect trying to figure out how the spatial logic and the material logic and the construction logic comes together to make the space. And I really appreciate these drawings, especially in this part of his career, because I think they really tie him very closely to where he came from. All the things that Gropius talked about, he was the ideal, I think, practitioner for this way of thinking and this pedagogical logic. There's also a time, thinking about the early 1950s, getting into the mid-1950s, um, Walter Gropius was worried about issues of um, reconstruction in Europe. There's a lot more um, discussion of large buildings, large complexes of buildings, urban design. And that started putting a lot of pressure on Rudolph, I think, to begin to expand his thinking beyond the single family house. So he was really good at citing really sensitively a house on the west coast of Florida and thinking about this material logic and thinking about operable devices that go back to his time at Alabama Polytechnic, which is now Auburn, and all the lessons that he took about regionalism. And now he was starting to think about how this culture was changing and the pressures that were being put on the profession to think about larger public buildings and civic space. And this is a really interesting period for me, this sort of time of change that happened. This is um, uh, Victor Lundy. Uh, this is his thesis project at Harvard, who was a, who was a few years behind um, Paul Rudolph, and a competitor of him on the west coast of Florida, a fine architect. But you can begin to see how Rudolph has this single family residence finely tuned to a landscape to Victor Lundy's project that's a much larger urban inclined um, contextual project. This is I.M. Pei's uh, thesis, and this was really praised by Rudolph, uh, by Gropius and the faculty at Harvard in this magazine. 
because it thought, they thought it had a monumental expression that a lot of other projects didn't have. And I think this is beginning, this kind of language is beginning to set up this culture of change in the environment. And at the same time, Rudolph's work starts to change. He starts to get larger. There's much more classical references to it. You can begin to see how this takes on a different kind of scale. There's a different relationship between the spaces. Instead of a simple bar, it begins to take on a much more complex relationship of spaces underneath. He's really trying to almost force an urban logic into a residential um, uh, program. And you can see how he was very much leading up to some of his later work in Florida that really sort of sets up the end of his practice in Florida, where he begins to think about urban complexes, urban relationships, um, and how you struggle with the scale of material. So this is Riverview High School, and you can begin to see the attenuation still there, but the program getting larger and larger. So this, this kind of change in his, his, his practice is a really interesting time to me. Because at the same time, he was beginning to look at massive materials. So from that thinness of those two layers of plywood that are made into a vault, you start to see the Milam house rising up, this sort of monumental kind of character or something. It has much more sort of archaeological, massive kind of feel to it. Um, you still see the material logic. You can read every block. He draws every 8 by 8 by 16 um, Ocala line block in the, in the house. And you begin to see how the logic of the spanning works and the precast concrete pieces. So you see the continuation of that, but you start to see a heaviness that's beginning to change in the work. And I think that goes back to Gideon. Even in the 1940s, Siegfried Gideon was writing articles about new monumentality, or nine points for a new monumentality, uh, written by, with Serret and Leger, an architect and planner and painter. And you can begin to see how this different part of his education starts to take on a different character. And I think something that is at the heart of this sort of building culture but is taking on a different um, quality. It's almost a diversion that's happening. And this is Sarasota High School, which I think is the sort of the ultimate building of his in Sarasota, done while he was no longer a Florida architect. This is when he had a practice in Cambridge. And you can begin to see some of these large um, relationships that begin to get established. There's a series of modules. This can almost go on forever. Um, but it still has this finely tuned sort of sunshades that come down, operable windows that allow, in, in an age of pre-air conditioning, time for air to move through the building. So it's trying to think about how the culture is changing, but still staying close to your roots. And what's really interesting to me right now is this: these are the buildings that he was talking about in 1958 when he took over as the chairman of the Yale School of Architecture when he met this class that will graduate in 1960. And this is where they were students. This is before the Arts and Architecture building. So he was teaching at Yale, and Kahn was teaching at Yale. He'd been there for quite a while, actually. And this is the Yale um, University Art Gallery. And when you look at this building, you, everybody has, has spent some time looking at it. This was the studio for, for the school before they moved into Rudolph's Art and Architecture building, which is right across the street. They had the top floor of this building. And they talked about uh, the students that I've talked to, and I've, I've contacted every student in her graduating class. Um, one woman, by the way, three started, one, one finished due to chafing. They talked about being up here and how it was an ideal studio environment. And they were really inspired by the, the, the flexibility of the building, almost like a warehouse. Right? You sort of, you'd have these quadrants. You can see the plan up here on the wall. Um, and it also has this ceiling plane that held a lot of Khan's ideas about space, about program, and how you begin to put material at the service of an idea. I think that was a really inspiring building to a lot of people. And this is the one, I've, I've heard the, the term brutalism a lot in, in, the past, in the past day, and I hear it all the time. This is the one building that Bantam talks about um, that seems to stick when it re relates to ideas of brutalism. If you think about this notion of there's a formal legibility in the plan, check, right? You can see this formal sort of axial legibility in this plan. So a clear exhibition of structure. You can begin to see with the structural logic of this. You can understand whether the ceiling might be a very difficult, convoluted thing, but there's a clear logic to it. And there's this notion of the value of material for its inherent qualities. You know that there's a brick doing a certain thing. You know that the concrete is doing a certain thing. And Bannum, Rainer Bannum, finishes it off with there's a bloody-mindedness to it. There's a bloody-mindedness to the way a brutal building, in his, his terminology, a new brutalist building, uh, is organized. There's a, there's a single-mindedness to it. And I think a lot of um, 
this term has gotten out into the world to talk about Rudolph's building, which I would argue the Arts and Architecture building is not a brutalist building. It doesn't meet any of those criteria. So trying to figure out as we sort of go into this unknown territory as we're beginning to name things, trying to figure out how, how, how we do name them. I think that's a really fascinating thing. And here's that ceiling. And literally the students when they were daydreaming would look up and then this was their inspiration. And I think that's a, that's a fantastic lesson to begin thinking about. But it was just a really logical space. So it was set up in these four quadrants. You've got four years of the undergraduate and you've got one year of graduate school. And that's how the program established itself. It just sort of fit nicely into this very kind of flexible space. This is Judith Chafee. Um, this is the architect that I've been spending a lot of time working on recently. Um, her, this is her in that uh, the Con Art Gallery building. And the people that I've talked to um, have discussed the, their first year as first year students thinking about design principles. They were sitting right next to Khan's master class. So as they went, were going around the building, you know, every, each year you take on a new quadrant, they happened to start right next to Khan's master class. So they started out with Khan teaching a master class right next to them. And they were infused with his theories. And that's a really, a really nice beginning, I think, thinking about principles. And that was really the first class that graduated with Paul Rudolph's undivided attention. So that's after he'd been there for a couple of years, and he was the thesis advisor for these students. So they started out with Kahn, and they ended with Rudolph, and they had all the debates of a changing architectural culture in between. And that's one of the things that has been fascinating with this research, is to interview the students that were in this class. Thank goodness I was able to talk to a lot of them and get some first, um, uh, some good quotes. This is her thesis project. This is her thesis review. You can begin to see a lot of this young sort of faculty. This, this was a, uh, a very intense group of people. Uh, there's, a, there's a series of these photos that has Judith Chafee with a wide range of uh, facial expressions. So you see uh, John Paul Carleon, which is a principal at Shepley Bullfinch, Philip Johnson, two students, Paul Rudolph, and then Henry Fister, the former um, dean of the program. And this is Judith Chafee presenting her thesis project, which is an art, art school for Bennington. And she is clearly thinking about this, these more massive, larger, complex buildings. They were, the students were encouraged to think about larger kind of planning problems, major public buildings, and ideas of permanence. Somebody was talking in the beginning of the, 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 the day about this notion of permanence. I think that was a lot of the discussion. These buildings were meant to last for a long time. And if you see a lot of the large, sort of heavier Rudolph buildings, they still look pretty good today, even though a lot of um, administrators have put Coke machines in all the wrong locations and moved a few things around. It was a very exciting place to be, I think. This was Rudolph, you know, not 40 years old. And a lot of people who are just trying to sort of find their way, starting these major public projects, a group of architects trying to figure out what this next place is, knowing very well that they were at the center of change in the culture. This is Stanley Tigerman's thesis project apartment building for Chicago, so thinking back to his home place, you can begin to see that pinwheel design coming in, solid and void, almost like the Harvard box. Do you add things or do you subtract things? So a lot of these lessons, but now taking on this much sort of heavier, larger kind of form, clearly uh, out of concrete. And interestingly enough, I think a lot of the students worked in Rudolph's office. They took a lot about how you set up a practice based on looking at how he worked. He had an office at 31 High Street, which is just two blocks away from the Arts and Architecture Building and the Kahn University Gallery. And one part of it was dedicated to his residence, and the other part was in a, a multi-story Italianate building. He renovated that building, and the top floor was his studio. So he would go back and forth between, usually as, a, as the chair, he was entertaining, and then he was going right back to studio up here working. So you can begin to see these two sort of parts of things. And having your life in a very sort of um, uh, close proximity meant a lot. And you look at a lot of these architects that came out of Yale, they have very similar arrangements. Everything from Norman Foster, who lives right above his office along the Thames, to Judith Chafee, who renovated an old adobe in Tucson. And here are some of those pictures that Judith Chafee and Stanley Tigerman uh, renderings that they worked on in Rudolph's office this time of change. And by the way, if you think of Bannum's definition, there's no way any of these iterations are new brutalism. There's, just, there's, there's no way you can, you can make the argument. And the other projects that were going on at the time, this is the Yale um, Mary Student Housing Project. So even Rudolph's rendering style was changing at this time. A lot of students actually stayed on in Rudolph's office. People like Tigerman, Stanley Tigerman and Judith Chafee went off into public uh, private practice. Around 1965 and 70, they started their own offices. 
but a lot of them stayed on and worked in Rudolph's office on projects like the Government Service Center in Boston or Endo Labs. This is one of Stanley Tigerman's early projects. And you can really begin to see even that sort of idea of this weight sort of rising up out of the ground and this heavy timber roof coming down on top of it. And this is Judith Chafee working at Edward Larrabee Barnes's office. So she, after she graduated, she worked in Rudolph's office for a while, worked on the A&A building, and worked on married student housing and also a house in Baltimore. And she worked for Gropius and Tack and Ben Thompson. Uh, she worked in the Saarinen office, and then finally with Edward Larrabee Barnes, and this is her, her working on a large project for Yale University. So she was really something during her period, and I think kind of like Rudolph, set up with a really sort of ideal education. She was set up to do great things, and I think it's really fascinating to track what she did. Her first project was a PA award. On the cover of PA, this is her first project she did, still in the Northeast. She stayed there, and this is a client that she has in Guilford, Connecticut. And this is the house um, taken from the shores of Guilford. And pretty remarkable. Um, your first house, cover of PA, PA award. I think she started feeling this sort of notion that she needed to get back to her home place to try to do the work that she wanted to do, which I think is the work that really Rudolph and his um, work in Florida really inspired. She thought going back to Tucson in the Southwest might allow her to do more work that she thought, and she uses the word authenticity. She moved back to one of the most historic neighborhoods uh, in downtown Tucson, and she makes a drawing to figure it out. Her, her office is uh, North Court. It's the building with one door and three punched openings in the bottom. So thinking about the city fabric, not just this individual building, she took three or four old adobe buildings, put them together, pulled the roof off of one of them, and made a courtyard, and the back was her residence, and the front was her studio, and she practiced there until she died in 98. Here it is. You can begin to see those parts, the front part being the, the most public behind the door, and then you go back and then there's this sort of inner sanctum of the public area, then you have an open courtyard, then you have her residence behind. And obviously this idea of mass is really important to her, so I think this idea of rising in weight of the architecture of that period made a lot of sense to somebody like Chafee, because she's coming from a culture that builds with dirt, if you're thinking about adobe, or in her case, a lot of times there was very, it was difficult to actually find Adobe Craftsman and the codes really wouldn't allow it. There's a lot of use of different kinds of block. In this case, uh, eight by eight by 16 block, mortar washed. Um, if anybody has been to San Javier, south of Tucson, you can begin to see her references to a lot of the sort of regional uh, endemic culture in the area. And those lessons that you learn to survive in a place that's really harsh. If you, the west coast of Florida is a pretty hard place to live without air conditioning. It, that is pretty easy, I think, compared to Tucson in the summer. Here's just a basic sort of cross-section, trying to figure out how you get light into the building and those essential sort of characteristics that make good buildings or a good room. So I think she learned a lot from Khan. If you're just thinking about the start of a really good building is making a good room that's well lit, that has a connection to the outside and is loyal to its program. She understood that. She also knew that if you're going to build in the Southwest, you make a tough building. And luckily, she also knew to inhabit the building with things that make a gracious place to live. And here is her, one of her most famous projects, which is the Ramada House. If you've seen Paul Rudolph's um, Umbrella House or, or the work of Le Corbusier, you can begin to see where she came from. Rising up, these two systems, one mass rising up out of the earth, and the other one, how to deal with the sun and shade coming down from above. Even just, how, how do you make an opening? How do you make an opening that has a connection to the outside? And she makes a prismatic glass where the glass actually folds down instead of a picture window. It almost puts you into the exterior space. So just took, taking time in her practice to really think about how to make a logic. This is the last project I'm going to show. This is the Heidman residence. Um, these are projects that we're all photographing right now with Bill Timmerman, who's a great architectural photographer, and he's helping us document a lot of these original projects that she had because original owners are still in the houses, but they're leaving, um, and they're selling these houses slowly. But if you look, this is a, like she called it a soil cement house, which was actually, it's a, it's a double cast in place concrete wall that uses um, material from the site and also has insulation built into the side of it. Uh, this is the 1970s, thinking about the energy crisis, so people were really struggling to try to build something that actually is much more habitable during the summer. 
But what I like about this, this building and thinking about from a preservation standpoint, this is a photograph that was taken last month and it looks as good as it did when it was constructed um, in the late 1970s. If you're thinking about that sort of notion of materials that don't change, a lot of Rudolph's early light buildings changed very quickly because it was easy to pull down a vault or change a very light, attenuated building. But these massive buildings, the weathering, Rudolph always talked about buildings being understood in the rain and different seasons, in sun and shade. I think a lot of those lessons were taken to heart by this series of uh, architects that went on to practice um, a half a generation after him. And here you begin to see the sort of light sort of top coming down, the sheltering roof that protects you from the, the sun, and then the stereotomic mass kind of rising up out of the ground. And this was a photograph that was taken uh, last month. Judith Chafee um, got a Rome Prize. She accepted a mid-career Rome Prize fellowship, and she decided to study something that, that we talked about a lot in Tucson, the difference between um, latitude and longitude. So the, the argument that latitude is much more important if you're an architect trying to study precedent, because you can begin to sort of go around and look at a possibly a, a much more similar um, climate, climate condition. And so she went to study the Mediterranean and some of the traditional architecture and how that adapted to that culture and that climate and then brought back those lessons to Tucson. So thinking about that ongoing education, especially connected to vernacular culture, and I think that's one of those great lessons for this generation is trying to really sort of unpack in a different way than Rudolph's generation that sort of connection of vernacular culture to high building culture. I've got about 20 seconds left, so I'm just going to talk a bit about um, a symposium that took place at Wash U. William Curtis was teaching at Wash U in the late 1980s, and this is the exciting part for writing, I think, as we're thinking about a culture of change. There is this bifurcation that happened in the architecture <coughs> culture between maybe what Robert Stern is doing now at Yale, who's also just behind Judith Chafee. Uh, we just saw a building by Michael Graves. And people like Judith Chafee and Doshi and different architects that took on a different sort of interpretation of what was going on at Yale. So there's this, there's this difference that was happening. And William Curtis here at WashU in 1987 had a symposium, um, and it was based on an article called Principle versus Pastiche, and about this cultural change in the, the, um, in, in the world of architects during that period. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have coming up, how we're going to deal with understanding that cultural change and taking that understanding and beginning to make decisions about preservation or whether buildings should die. Thank you very much.